G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm interviewing Olivia Carr, founder of Shilk, which is an interesting name in itself, and I'm sure Olivia will talk about that. Uh, Olivia is based in Victoria, Australia, so thanks for your time, Olivia. Thank you so much for having me. So um, we connected uh, probably a few months ago after I listened to you on Timbo Reed's podcast, which um, I love on small business marketing, and thought, well, you'd be a great um, guest for our uh, podcast to hear your journey. And, and since then, I've read your book called Self Made, which I uh, thoroughly recommend for any business owner to read it because it's just a great story. Um, and I'm sure you'll give us some insights today in our conversation. So um, just just kick off. Tell us, uh, our audience, a little bit about is, is yourself and your business. Yeah. So I am the founder of Silk, and you're right, it's not the easiest name to say, and there's a story behind it. Um, there's always a story. Yeah. I launched the brand in 2015 when I was 34. Um, it's the second business I've had. I, I had my first business when I was 24, uh, touring around Australia, doing a company called Shows for Kids, where I would educate kids about healthy eating, cyberbullying, all the things tying it into curriculum. Um, and then, yeah, decided to start my second business in 2015 which started just with silk pillowcases cases and has now grown to, uh, at one point we had over 200 different products and we've just pulled that back um, to be a bit more sustainable to around 80 products. And we sell products in beauty retailers on our website and also through some of the world's best hotels. Yeah, now awesome. And so you started in 2015, yeah. uh, the, the business. So, so how, did you, how did that start? What was the sort of motivation? Yeah, so prior to that, I was a general manager at Pacific Brands, so Bonds, Sheridan, um, and the, that retail group, and I was dabbling in kind of e-commerce because really back in 2015, whilst it was only kind of eight years ago, e-commerce as an ecosystem was still relatively new. Like a lot of the big brands were still like, oh, what is this thing? Do we really want to invest in it? So I was really lucky and fortunate in that role to kind of get some exposure to what e-commerce was. And I thought, wow, that's so interesting. Like that's something that it kind of sparked my curiosity. So I left there and I went to America um, to have a look at, I guess, some ideas and to see what I could kind of build upon, knowing that I definitely wanted to start a new business. Um, and it was just, I guess, a bit of luck, a bit of fate that I lost my um, silk pillowcase that I had owned for many years the first night I was in New York because it got taken off the housekeeping. Um, and it was up only five weeks later when I couldn't find one in America to replace it uh, that I got home and I was like, oh. Like they cost $100. It's quite annoying to have to replace this thing. I really want a zip uh, in the pillowcase. And they just didn't exist on the internet. So I thought, hmm, could this be an idea? And three days later, I found myself traveling uh, through Asia, learning everything about silk. And then three months later, I launched it. So it's how it started. Simple idea. <laughs> yeah, and that's often how, it's, how it often starts from uh, my experience with business owners. Um, I guess it's like you say, it's... Uh, Something that it was uh, particular to yourself that you sparked the idea and um, away you go. So you started in 15. If you're happy to share, how old were you in when you uh, kicked 34. off? 34. 34. Yeah. yeah. Which I think is a really, really good. I was just talking to someone last night, actually, that's opening a new really cool AI gallery in Victoria. Um, and he's 34. And I was like, you know what? 30, like mid thirties is a really good, well, one, there's never an age where you can't start a business, no. but I think it's a really good age to start a business because you've had enough life experience. You're still willing to take risk to some degree. Yeah. And I think you're just a little bit more mature. Whereas in my twenties, I just didn't have the kind of life experience to really know what to do with the business. And then I just ended up being burnt out and walked away from it. So mm. it's also another lesson, I think. The older, maybe the older you get, the easier it is to start a business. I don't know. Yeah, possibly. I think it's a good good point. And I think you, many ways, um, Silk is your second business. So I guess your learnings from the first one, right, that you then brought into the current business uh, also helps. I think it's just, um, I think, uh, uh, you know, as a business coach, it's all those learnings and that sort of get you to where you get to. And obviously you build resilience as one 
piece over the years, which certainly you have knowing your story. So I think, as you say, it's uh, there's never the the right age, but uh, if, you, if you're going to pick a sort of age bracket, then you're probably right. So have you got any um, key numbers you can share to show the growth of your, of your business? Yeah, I mean, I'm obsessed with numbers, so anyone that's read the book or maybe potentially reads it in the future will realise I've had an interesting journey with my love for numbers. Um, and I think that's important to acknowledge. Like, I think a lot of business owners, maybe because they don't like me, maybe haven't had experience or expertise in the financial side of a business. It's really fascinating that you go into it thinking that everything's about the revenue and how much, you know, how many sales you can get. And I definitely fell in that, that kind of category for many years. So there's two answers I could give you to that question. It's like, yes, I could share the revenue growth and how amazing that was, which to be fair, like we went from, zero dollars to like five hundred and eighty three thousand dollars in our first year like first 12 months like that for us like a startup is amazing mm. the story mm. behind that was we weren't making money we were like investing so much capital into it that that's actually not a good story it depends how you look at it but the truth yeah. is for the first three and a half years we didn't we our revenue growth was incredible but the business wasn't making profit until i think midway like halfway through the fourth year and the reason that it even got to that point was um, because I had actually hired a financial advisor to like a strategic advisor to kind of say to me, something's not working. <laughs> like we're working so hard, we're putting so much money in this and we're getting a lot of sales, but it's not dropping down, you know, the other end. And that was a really hard lesson to learn, just how much I didn't know about the numbers and and how much leakage we had and how, you know, this like I, I put this in the book, the most simplest business metric that anyone needs to follow is you essentially need to spend less than you earn, right? It's mm -hmm. like, it really is that simple. Yeah. But if you don't have your eye on the pulse, it's really hard. So now when I answer that question, what I prefer to talk about is the, I guess, our net profit. And this year we're back in double digit net profit. Again, the average over the last kind of four years has, you know, been around about the 16% net profit, which I don't know, like I think it's fascinating because even when I mentor other small business owners, I think a lot of people wouldn't even know the answer to that question. Like mm. if you ask them what's your net profit, they just would look at you like a you know deer in headlights, like what are you talking about? So I'm so passionate, as I'm sure you are, about really educating brand owners on that's probably where you need to start. Like, you know, what's, I call it like that's what a sustainable business. It's like, you know, when I talk about in the book, having a sustainable business, a big part of sustainability is also the cash flow of your business. And um, yeah, so that's for me, I just really, to be honest, I just want to keep it in that double digits. And that actually fascinating means that sometimes you don't need to chase, you know, the revenue. You can actually be far more profitable if you actually just reassess your entire business, which we actually had to do during COVID. And I mean, it's a much it's a much healthier headspace to be when you're actually making profit every month, and that's what you're focusing on. And sure, top line growth is important, but not if it's affecting the bottom line. Yeah, that's a good uh, a good insight. And uh, there's a saying I love: um, revenues, vanity, profits, reality, and cash is king. Yeah, um, which sort of talks to exactly what you, you're talking about. So, um, yeah, focus on that bottom line. Yes, revenue does drive it, but um, not be solely focused on the revenue. Mm -hmm. What about uh, full-time equivalent employees? How many have you got now? Yeah, so we're down to seven staff. I would be the only full-time employee. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone else here is part-time, and that is because that's a choice. So we are a very flexible workplace. Like I'm the only person in the office at the moment. We've got people that start some mornings at 7, people that start at 10.30, people that start at lunchtime. We use an app called Deputy and it's very much um, you log on. I mean, within reason, they log on when they can. They do their hours and then they log off. So that flexibility has always been there, but it's probably like there more now after COVID that, you know, I trust that people know they have a job to do. But if they have things on in the morning, like, you know, it's Christmas at the moment, maybe they've got stuff that they need to do and they can come in later. Yeah, it's so the rest of them are all um, part-time employees. Yeah. So it would be around four full-time employees? Equivalents? Is that sort of around maybe the uh, well most of them, so most of them work three days. Right, okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Aside from my daughter who's right, yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um so when was the moment you felt like you had succeeded? <laughs> Success is an interesting word. Mm. I also cover this in the book. Um 
I mean, the moment that I knew that the business had potential probably was within that kind of first 12 months, just when there's an appetite for the product early, when you're getting wholesale inquiries early, when, I don't know, influential people want to purchase your product, when the path to entry to get into a hotel is, you know, the appetite is there. I think it was it was early. I mean, I remember saying to myself, I'll give myself six months to prove the business model. I think we proved it definitely in that first 12 months, but it's interesting because, again, now I look at success completely different. It's not just the branding of the brand. That's hugely important. It is. But I would say it was probably most successful kind of during the COVID time when I thought I was going to lose it all and we actually were able to turn the whole business around. Yeah. Yeah, That's great. I think when people get your book and and read it, the the story of how you got the Kardashians to uh, use your product, um, I think a lot of people might have thought that's when you you, you felt you succeeded, but we won't sort of go into too much detail because that'll uh, ruin the story for those who want to read your book, right? Yeah. I mean, look, there's definitely been some amazing kind of moments that I'm super grateful for that still happen today. I mean, we still have a relationship with the family, so... Mm -hmm. You know what? There's a lot of tiny moments. I would say it's like yes. a, it's it's a lot of small tiny moments. It's probably not the big point zero 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 one percenters like that. Yep. Yeah. No, that's a very good point. All those one percenters add up, don't they? Yeah. So, what does success look like for you? Success has changed a lot. Uh, when I first started the brand, I again I was very revenue focused, and I was like, I want to get it to you know fifty mil, and want to be here, there, and everywhere. And really that was just, I think a lot of my ego was like, I had this idea that to be successful, it had to mean, you know, ridiculous numbers. Um, For me now, success probably looks like being able to do what we're doing at the moment. Um, Once again, with all of our giving for Christmas time, we do a lot of stuff in the community. We have so many social initiatives going on. I've just launched a social initiative called the Self-Made Squad, which is very like Gordon Ramsay, where he goes in and turns restaurants around. Mm -hmm. uh, we go in and turn small businesses around free of charge. They apply on our website. Um, we filled up our calendar for the whole of 2024 with small businesses around the country. To me, that that like I don't know, it might sound corny to other people, but giving is one of like one of my top two values. So success to me is being in a position where I can give back constantly, where I am not necessarily tied to a nine to five, where I can work from anywhere. Like it's, I guess in some ways, it's a little bit of a lifestyle now for me. Yeah. Um, it's, but it's a big part of that is tied to giving back and I guess living life with intention. Like, you know, it's great to have a business and it's great to achieve things, but like for what, mm. like why, why are you doing that? And I think that's a really important thing for people to go through this whole process. And I talk a lot in one of the chapters of the book, it's like, why are you, what are you aiming for? Like, and where is that end point? Because for me, I know, like I talk about it when we got to our first mill, I thought that was some sort of metric and it's like, okay, well now what? Okay, then you get to two mil. Well, now what? Like the numbers aren't really mm. what matters. It's like you have to stop and go, well, why am I doing this? And what do I fundamentally care about? Oh, it's like giving. Well, what do I need to do with my business to be in a position where I can help more people, where I can impact people, where I feel like every single day there's been purpose behind the why of what I'm doing? Because you and I can both agree, like running a business is really challenging more often than it's not. Yeah. So there's not a big reason as to why you're doing it. Then you have to sort of ask yourself why you are doing it at all. Mm. No, it's great. Um, I think it comes back to the Simon Sinek and, and the why, right? So it's uh, very powerful. Um, and good on you for that self-made squad. I mean, that's an awesome initiative. Yeah. Um, so but, yeah, I look forward to hearing how that all goes in the in the new year. Yeah, we're very excited. So yes. Well, there's a lot of exciting things coming in 2024 with that, so that's very cool. Yeah, that's awesome. So what's the uh, number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a, a fast-growing business? Marketing's fun, so always start with fun in mind. And I would say that, you know, I've worked for some of the biggest retailers in the country. You don't need large budgets. What you need is large ideas. Um, so whatever it is for the for you as an individual, whatever that space is that can get you in the most creative kind of headspace, whether you need to be around other entrepreneurs, where you need to go to networking things, where you need to be in rooms, where you're all having kind of very inspiring conversations, you need to be doing that regularly because you're going to get more success by doing, I mean, you just mentioned to me, um, I've never heard of it, but a guy named Steve Stims, 
uh, Steve Sims, Go for Stupid. Like, I'm going to download that book, but it sounds very much like that's what people need to be doing is like all the things I love doing, like think outside the box and then think again and just don't be scared to take risks. Mm -hmm. Like, and always remember that whatever the marketing is that you're doing, what's that? What's that moment that that person's going to feel when they either see you do the thing, receive the thing? You know, the days of just sending product to people and thinking that they're going to be excited by that are long gone. Yep. Yeah, that's sort of the, the go for stupid. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, some of the, a lot of the things, it's you haven't got a lot to, to lose. And um, I think it's more the, the fear of maybe what people think or, or, or fear of something. So I think, um, yeah, there's a lot in it. And you've certainly, yeah. Uh, uh, followed that um, approach over over your journey today. So it's uh, fantastic. Do you, um, as a matter of interest, do you use Net Promoter Score by any chance? We do don't. You? However, we run a system called Gorgeous for our customer service, and that mm. can send out um, you know random surveys and things. So we measure it. We measure things like the happiness, I guess, score of our customer service responses. Yeah, we have our yacht pose, which is our reviews, which is slightly different, but that's a good measure to know how well you're doing in the whole kind of landscape. I would say delivery is still one of those areas. Any any retailer will attest that delivery can be really challenging because whilst you might look at it, it's out of your control how long it takes. At the end of the day, you're the brand, so you own the entire process. And I think brands do better accepting and acknowledging that as opposed to being like, hey, you know, chase it up with your you know, chase it up with these people. It's like, no, you're the brand owner. You sold the product. You need to take care. So you need to obsess over customer happiness for the entire journey. Yeah, no good tip. You got to own it, don't you? Mm-hmm. Um, how did you fund your business? Yeah, so I did that myself initially. And another huge learning is what you think a business will cost, probably quadruple it. Um, no, in my experience, um, because there's always unexpected things especially if it's something new that you haven't tried before. It's very hard to predict how much money you're going to need. But also equally, it's really important to sort of look at what you're spending money on and why and what the return's going to be. So I started the business with $53,000 and I genuinely thought that was going to get me through six months and it evaporated faster than I could blink. Uh, and that's because I bought too much stock at the beginning. I didn't know how to negotiate with suppliers. All the lessons that I talk about now, it's like I would, if I if I could reverse the clock, what I would do now is I would start. And this is so boring um, for anyone that's like me, that's a creative person, but it's so important. I would literally start with the lean methodology from day one, which essentially, for anyone who doesn't know what that is, it's really just in a simple kind of simplified term. It's running it as, like it says, lean as you can. So don't go and hire staff until you're at breaking point. Don't overstock things. Um, even that is, is there other ways you can do it? Don't get a warehouse. Can you 3PL? Like just, just strip it right back to running the lightest model that requires the, the least amount of cash flow. Because literally I burnt through that money and then I shark tanked my old boss, um, to get some investment. There was a property sold at one point. Um, yeah, it was a lot. Yeah. Yeah, certainly some uh, learnings in the experience, right? So um, have you accessed any grants along the way so far? Yeah, so I always get this wrong. I don't know if it's the EDMG or the EGM. I think it's EMDG, the Export yep. Marketing Development Grant. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So yep. we've done that every year. That's um, It's getting more and more popular. So, again, I would highly recommend that for any brand that's especially doing any stuff overseas. It's like a really useful uh, grant. We use a a company to help us kind of facilitate that. It's a lot of work the first year that you do it, but once it's set up properly, um, you know, that's super helpful. We haven't ever, we've looked into some R&D grants before. We've never really pursued it. We were just talking about that this week, actually, looking into that again. Aside from grants, that's probably it. In terms of like where else we've accessed capital from over the years, I mean, if anyone's using Shopify, they launched like a Shopify capital a few years ago. And what I love about that one um, is more so it will take it based on the individual's um, performance. So they obviously know the right kind of measurement to give you the funding, but then they also make it really simple and take the money back out of uh, your daily sales. So cash flow, it's really helpful for small brands. Other ways that small brands can access funds is the same, very similar model through PayPal working capital. Uh, we have not ever used the bank. 
Um, so it's always just been little small injections of cash from things like PayPal and Shopify. Yeah, and I've heard Shopify's got a, a a nice, simple and practical lending facility. So, it's, uh, yeah. So, yeah. again, good to hear. Yeah. Um, there's a, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, when you set up the business, it costs a lot more than you anticipate. There's a rule I came across uh, years ago, sort of the four by two rule, so which is essentially it, it uh, takes you either four times longer or twice as twice more expensive than you anticipate, or four yeah. times more expensive and twice as long. Which sort of talks to uh, to what you were your experience. Yeah. And that can be that can be dangerous um, because it got to the point where kind of three years in, I can't remember the quote. I shared it um, probably a couple of years ago because in my mind mentally, I was so I was so deep in it because I'd invested and reinvested so much money in the business that it got to the point where I was kind of chasing chasing that back rather than focusing on growth. I was always like, oh "My God, I've invested this much," and the quote was something like, "Don't chase." Um, I can't remember what it was, but essentially it was like, don't chase your losses, you know, chase the growth or something like that. And it really stuck with me because I was like, I fell into that trap where I'm, you know, you almost feel like you're trapped in your own business because you're chasing the money that you've invested in. And that's, that was not helpful for me. You know, I had a, I started, I suffered from anxiety in 2017 because I, I guess I had like mental exhaustion. I was like burning the candle at both ends, which is very common uh, in business. But I think a lot of that came down to this like need to always try and get back what I'd lost and it just is not a healthy headspace to be in. Mm. Kind of got to cut your losses and start fresh every kind of almost every day. It's like every day is a new day. You know, yesterday may have been a good day or it may have been a not so good day, but what can you do today to grow the business and what can you do to get profit today? It really has to be broken down very simply too because otherwise it's a black cloud that's constantly chasing you that you feel like you're searching for this huge amount of cash that you've put in that realistically you may not like you may not actually see it again yeah yeah we've got to treat it like you're saying as a sort of a sunk cost it, it's been and gone it's more what's in front of you yeah you're not trying to chase your tail as you say no one really talks to you about like no one talks to people about all this stuff because there's no. there's a, still very much people like to pretend they're killing it or pretend yeah. they're successful because maybe they have their own kind of i don't know lack of self-belief or they have shame around it and it's like that's not helpful for anyone like we need to have more open conversations around the fact that hey i'm not currently making profit or this is what i'm experiencing with my cash flow can we all just have some open transparent conversations around how we can kind of turn it around and in my experience working with brands the number one way to turn that around is actually your mindset Mm. it's actually it, it really does start with and i go deep into this in the book but that's and the reason I go deep into it in the book because ultimately I don't think you can turn your business around until you've actually turned your own mindset around yeah couldn't agree with you more over I think that's one of the the biggest challenges of small business owners is their own mindset um mm-hmm. and everyone's got their own paradigms but yeah. um and I guess you know that's one of our key drivers to do these podcasts to talk to business owners like yourself that that share their ups and downs and mm. so yeah. people can learn and hopefully don't have to go through it yeah. um, to the same extent possibly. So Yeah. So I mean, just, I think now, like we're in a really quite challenging financial, you know, yeah. economy right now and, and spending is down or it's flat, like all the reports are out there. And I remember getting to the kind of July period this year and you can kind of very much get consumed in this other world is ending and it's doom and gloom out there. And if that's how you're approaching driving your business, the results are just not going to be there. Um, so we came back, you know, as a team this year, July 1, and we were like, you know what, screw the noise, like just block the noise out. Yeah. Noise is always going to be there. There's always going to be something. If it's not an economy, if it's not a pandemic, there will always be a reason to think that it's hard. Mm. And we decided, you know what, well, whatever it takes, like that's whatever it takes, even despite the external challenges, what can we do today? Like what's one thing we actually can do today? And we've made profit every month, you know, in this financial year in a really challenging economy, whereas a lot of brands are not. But then my question to them would be, well, what are you at? Like, what can you control? Can you take right. costs out? Can you, like, yeah. there's there's generally ways you can, but you have to be prepared to kind of look Absolutely. at it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, you, you can only control what you can control, right? So you start listening to the noise and all that external factors. You can soon lose focus and get wrapped up with all the bullshit, but like you're doing, and you, and proofs in the pudding. So yeah. yeah, well done. So can you outline the most stressful point in your small business journey so far? Uh, there's been a couple. So one of the big learnings initially were we only had one supplier um, in the early days. Uh, and that that was a big lesson in itself because we had all of our eggs in one basket and, of course, things can go wrong all the time. Um, you know, we were going through price negotiation with the supplier at the time and they were not willing to negotiate and I wanted to negotiate. And they literally held our stock at ransom and said, well, we're not releasing your stock until you sign the new pricing. And it's like, ouch, like that, that, that yeah. kind of hurts. Yeah. Um, and that, But that was ultimately a lesson. It's like, well, we didn't have a fallback at that time. So... You know, I had I really had no negotiating power. So I'd say that like that doesn't maybe sound that stressful, but when you're living through that journey at the time, that was that actually is what led into my like kind of breakdown that I had in 2017. That was a big one. Um, I think going through the early stages of the pandemic were actually really challenging. Uh, we're in a luxury kind of space. Um, this is before all the government handouts. Uh, we felt the impact like almost suddenly. Um, I remember, you know, March 20, getting on Instagram and, and being really open to our audience. I, I had worked it out. I thought we had about six weeks left. And again, we asked for people's help. We were very transparent with people. I shared, like openly shared screenshots of our bank account. We were in debit for the first time in years. But then I think that's been my biggest strength. We just dug so deep. We were so innovative. We came up with like new ways. We kind of there was so much that I learned from that and we actually turned the business around and ended up ironically having our strongest profit year ever and revenue year. Um, I mean, e-commerce turned around as well. Who would have known that though? Literally mm -hmm. no one. But that was a particularly both personally and professionally like a really challenging time because we just didn't have enough cash reserve in the bank to, mm -hmm. you know, withstand a global pandemic. I mean, I think a lot of brands didn't. Oh, no one, yeah. yeah, a lot of brands didn't. That was. The, the other silver lining is that was really the kind of kick up the butt that I really needed to kind of really understand the financials behind the business, not just the profit, not just like I had to understand everything and that I'm really quite grateful for. Yeah, I think, yeah, like you say, probably many businesses got that kick up the butt as you, as you call it during the pandemic and uh, you can only hope they, they learn from it um, yeah. and don't go back into bad habits. Yeah, yeah. What area of the business do you feel you had to work on the most to have the greatest value? Uh, digital marketing is, you know, I'm in the marketing space, but digital marketing, it's something that you have to be on daily. It's not, you know, I had a conversation with someone that owns an agency this week. It's tricky. You know, you can't, as a business owner, you can't be an expert at everything. You're not supposed to be. But you ultimately, these days, you sort of need to know more and more about everything. Uh, and then there's the knowing part and then it's like, okay, well, if you're a small business, are you at a point where you can put on a resource full time? Because something like a meta, it really requires, you know, it's not a set and forget model. You need to be in there. Every, if you do the set and forget, like I did in the first two years, you will literally lose money. You need to be in there every day. You need to be reviewing things. You need to be looking at data and then it changes. And then it's like, oh, well, just when you've got your head around it, it changes again. And I saw something this um, this week on, um, you know, we use a system called Clavio for our emails. Something's about a big, massive change is coming with like permissions and things for Google. And I was like, oh, here we go again. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's getting harder and harder. Like there was, so I would say that I have to constantly from the self-learning piece, definitely stay on top of, I guess, that space. That's really hard though, because when you're also running a business, it's hard to be across all things. But if you're in e-commerce like me, digital marketing is your I guess that's how you get your foot traffic in your store. So it's really yeah. important. Yeah. Yep. Do you um, use email marketing to an extent? Yeah. Yeah. So we use um, Clavio, which is, uh, and again, I think the most powerful thing with, with email marketing is getting your flows, automation, you know, areas where you can automate, definitely automate. Like, you know, have a really seamless post-purchase uh, email flow set up. If you don't know how to do that, there's some amazing kind of companies out there where you might spend one or $2,000 and they'll set up, you know, maybe 10 or 15 automated flows. So it's that is kind of locked in and set and forget, and you might refresh it every year. Email's super powerful. SMS is probably one of our strongest channels right now. From a consumer side, it's probably the most annoying for consumers, I think. It's the most, 
it's kind of a little bit intrusive, even though there's always the unsubscribe and the consumer can unsubscribe. It's it's probably the one that's like right in their pocket. So it's like you've got to be really careful. We segment ours so we don't just blast SMSs out. And also just don't SMS people unless you really have a strong offer. Like it's mm. that, otherwise to me that's like you, you sort of with an email you can you can almost send whatever you like, mm. you know, whereas with SMSs I would save that for when you, you know, when it's worth the person opening the message. Yeah, yeah good point. What uh, have you enjoyed the least about managing growth so far? Um, I am more of a – I'm more of a – doer than a natural leader uh i'm good at leading the team in terms of inspiring them getting them on the bus getting them onto the big picture um do i necessarily have a lot of time in my day to sit down and do the whole one-on-one the nurture piece probably not systematically um so i found that that you know at one point we had 11 staff that was that was too much to be honest that was too much for one person to manage whilst they didn't all directly report into me that felt almost like breaking point. Like I was like spending way too much time on the people side of the business. And that it just, that I I just remember that time. I just really struggled with it. I think where we're at now, like having seven staff is, is I know what feels right. Mm -hmm. um, And that feels comfortable. You know, 11 staff is too small to have a HR and even a HR, their job isn't really to, to manage the people. It's to kind of look after the, I guess, more the compliance and, things with the company, but I have found that side. And I know a lot of people uh, would say the same, like the people mm-hmm. management side, when you're trying to also run and grow the business. But I've also learned that now I'm at a point where I probably need to be more like the kind of CEO of the business and less doing and more leading. So mm-hmm. that's kind of where I'm at in 2024 is like, yeah, maybe taking wearing a different hat next year. Yeah. And I think um, to that point, that is really important if you're, if you have got growth aspirations, um, so obviously, you know, in most businesses, people uh, are a key plank to that. So, yeah, people are your business. Like, I, we like, we're a very family focused business. Like I said, like, even the start times, you don't need permission. Like, there's mm. so many things in here. Like, we, when everyone comes in today, we're, you know, we're all outside having our smoothies and having our like weekly catch up. So, I'd say it's more, in, it's an informal culture where we, you know, we have morning teas a lot. We go to the movies, we go for walks, we run together. We, but do I do the corporate, like, let's sit down, let's review your KPIs. Like, I don't track people to that degree purely because that's the culture that I would like to work in. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, you need to recognize that, you know, some employees will thrive with a bit more of a relaxed approach and some actually do better with more structure. So it's yeah. finding that balance too. That's right. Yeah, yeah. there's no, uh, no one size fits all. That's for sure. Yeah. And what do you love most about growing a small business? The fun, the fun and the giving. Uh, the fun lights me up. Like I'm an energy person. Like when we're doing crazy stuff, like we're you know about to launch something pretty cool on the first of Jan. It's like that sort of stuff lights me up. Like it energizes me. It, it keeps me going. The giving stuff is my north star. So it's like that's why I do what I do. Which just yeah. So both of those things. It's like the kind of human side and then the kind of crazy cool ideas side. Yeah, no, cool. And you mentioned mindset being really important in business. So what's been your biggest mindset shift in in your journey so far? Yeah, I would say, um, well, firstly, I'm very grateful and privileged to be in a position where I've had so much therapy through my kind of professional journey. So in the last kind of 12 months alone, I've had 34 sessions of psychology. And that's purely because writing the book brought out quite a lot of, you know, areas that I need to really work through. But interestingly, even with psychology, I don't think a lot of people realize this as business owners or as kind of even just adults. A lot of what you talk about in therapy is actually really mindset stuff, right? It's really having a look at the way that I think about things and maybe how I can reshape my own thinking. So I would say that like at work, as an example, like it's sometimes quite easy to fall into that like I said before, that victim mindset, like, oh, well, there's a pandemic, so that's why it's happening. Yeah. And you can almost be like, you almost accept adversity because adversity exists. And it's like, well, no, you can't do that. You can either sit in it or you can switch your mindset and say, okay, well, that might be true. And it is true that there's a pandemic, but there are still things in my control. So what is in my control? And one of the things that I think I got from therapy that I share in the book is um, it's called Circles of Influence. 
And, you know, the, the very small circle in the middle is the things that you can control, your mindset, your attitude, um, you know, literally the, thing, the only things you can control. And then the circle around that is the things that you can influence, which might be, um, I don't know, things to do with your team and, you know, the culture and things like that. And then the outside, which is interestingly where we all tend to, to focus, is things out of our control, the pandemic, government, economy death, health, all these things. And I noticed with business, if I was to do the, the outside, you know, it's there'd be a lot of stuff in there that I would be focusing on all the time, like the doom and glooms. And it's like, that's not getting me anywhere. So my therapist said, well, in future, when your mind goes to the outer circle, try very hard to come back to that center. And now I try and remind myself all the time, well, control the controllables. Mm. And that's, that is what I was saying before. Like to anyone listening, Every, every business owner will be going through something right now. Some of them will be similar. Some will be quite unique to the brand. If they did nothing or got nothing else out of this kind of chat, it would be, well, what can they do today that's in their control? And then tomorrow when they come in, what's one thing they can do tomorrow that's within their control? And it's that kind of momentum every single day, focusing on that one thing that you can control. You literally can turn almost all situations around. Yeah. That's a, a good point. Um, it's just doing the little things really well. Yeah. Um, and consistency is key and that sounds really simple, but it's hard to be consistent. Yes. Yeah. And I definitely find that difficult. Uh, like, you know, it's bright, shiny objects. There's always stuff but uh, going on. But I think, yeah, if you do the little things really well, and it might be boring, but at the end of the day, it's, it's so important around that consistency piece. Yeah. Um, so what's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? A morning routine. Absolutely a morning routine. Um, we don't, as business owners, get a lot of time to ourselves to fill our cup up. And I think it's super important. Like one of my favorite books is The Miracle Morning. And it talks a lot about, you know, setting up your day. It's called the savers methodology. So you start with like silence and then it's affirmations and then it's visualization and then exercise, reading, and writing or scribing. Yeah. And that in itself, that not everyone will have an hour in the morning, um, but even if it was, you know, six minutes, starting every day intentionally, I call it mind training, like it's just getting your mind set up for the day. Another great way if you're not into doing all of that is just moving your body in the morning, whether it's a walk or it's the gym. I think that, that honestly, like my old personal trainer used to say, win the morning, win the day, and it's so true. Like yeah. it's, it's so true. If you start your day, nature therapy is like I'm huge on nature therapy, getting out by the beach, getting into a park, taking your shoes off. These, all of these things, like they really sound like, oh, well, how could that help? But they genuinely make a significant impact on your overall kind of energy and focus and wellness, to be honest. Yeah, and no, I can attest to that. Uh, it definitely works. Uh, one or more of these growth pillars standing in the way of you living the lifestyle you've signed up for? People, strategy, marketing, funding, or systems. We have a free ebook filled with actions and templates on each of these growth pillars. Download for free from our website, growalsmallbusiness.com. So with uh, you've got sort of seven people in your team um, at the moment, and you've obviously added and subtracted over the last number of years. So can you share some sort of wins, mistakes, and advice around, um, you know, adding people to your team? Yeah. Uh, like I said earlier, make sure that, you know, you're at that kind of breaking point where you really need someone. Um, two reasons. One, cash flow. Like you need to be able to make sure, and it's not just their salary that you have to kind of consider. It's all the, you know, the benefits that they need. And then it's also that you've got time to actually like develop that person. So it's like there's quite a lot to consider. And I would say that that's most important when you go to your first hire. Like you might think as a business owner, oh, I need someone because I need them to help me with my emails. So, like, okay, that's kind of the problem. That's the job you're giving them. But when you get them there, how are you going to develop them? How are you going to, you know, make this job amazing for the employee? So I think there's a lot to consider about before you just go hiring people. Um, I also think that I know I fell into the trap of thinking or believing that success equaled a large team. That would kind of be against the lean methodology. It's like right people, right roles, right timing, all the things. 
So there's a great book that I also love called The 7% Club by Jenny Stilwell from Melbourne. There's so many amazing kind of worksheets and, and activities in that book that talk about what are the things, what are the tasks that you currently at the moment really need filled? And it kind of helps you really map out the type of role because you might think you need something and actually really what you need is something else. Mm -hmm. My other thing with that is explore other options before you actually employ people. So can these things be done virtually now? Can they be done remote? Is there a shared resource? Like start, like we started with a freelance. Our first hire was a graphic designer. It's very common in e-commerce to need graphic designer. Content is king. We started on a freelance model first to kind of get an understanding of what will be the recurring tasks, how, you know, how many hours do we need kind of this resource? And that's what helped us realize, well, we probably need someone four days a week, not five, or we need them three days a week, not five. And um, so my advice would be probably test it first. I mean, you have to be so intentional when you, I believe, you have to be really intentional when you bring people into your team because it's, especially if you're a small team, it is very like it is a family kind of feel. It's it's very different to working in a large corporate where, you know, all the systems are in place, all of the processes set up, there's HR divisions, there's development teams. Like you're you're all of that. You have to be able to supply that because even though you're a small business, that is still an employee. They still deserve the same kind of, I guess, treatment that they would get working for a large company within reason. Yeah. And and they want that right yeah so yeah what are some things you'd recommend to what we call a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with growth yeah i mean sustainable we're a plastic free brand so like let's talk about like i guess the planet i think if you're a product-based business um looking at even down to i guess the what i'd call like the basics where you should start is like how can you start eliminating some of these things from your business yes you might be putting slight cost in to have a recyclable and recycled product um, but actually the benefits can flow through the other end because I think consumers value this a lot more now than they have in the past. Sustainability to me, like I also think like profit is a big thing. Like you, sustainability, you need to have a cash flow positive business, you know, if possible. You need to have like a reason for even existing. Like I took, I touch on this a little bit in the book. I'm like, sometimes I look at it and I'm like, that there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of, stuff out there now and it's like if you're going to bring a new product into the world my preference would be that you really sit with that and say does the world need this like does the world need this thing do we already have and that's like getting into a whole new conversation around yeah. like yeah. but if you're a good kind of human that cares about all this sort of stuff again comes back to start with the why like why are you really doing this like this i'm not an advocate for these you know fast brands that pop up on facebook and they sell a million of something and it's very gimmicky and then it goes away. I'm like, that's not good for anyone. Like, mm -hmm. so my advice would be really do some of that inner work and say, you know, to be a conscious, can, to be a conscious CEO, which is, you know, something that I would like to think I am is why are you doing what you're doing? How does it serve others beyond just making money? Yeah. Which all is forms part of your culture, right? Yeah. So much yeah. professional development have you invested in yourself? Over yeah. The journey. Um. So again, to get me through, like I had immense debt in my twenties um, as a young mum, and one of the very first things that a mentor intro introduced me to was kind of personal development through reading books, listening to CDs. Um. So I was exposed to that at a relatively young age. I then went on to work for one of Australia's largest um, leadership companies that used to do like training around kind of leadership and sales and mentoring and um, all the things. So I was exposed to that as an employee, which was amazing. Um, I have had coaches, mentors. I still have mentors. I invest heavily in, you know, even if you don't have cash for this, like I do things like listen to TED Talks all the time. I'm constantly listening to podcasts. Um, there's a lot of free kind of development. I think books are amazing, mm. audio books. There's so much information readily available for people now to do their own development. I am big though on there's one thing to kind of consume it and then there's another to actually action it. Yeah. I think we live in a society where there's so much content out there and a lot of people are consuming a lot of things. But my question would be how much of it are you actually then actioning or trying to kind of, because otherwise all you're doing is kind of filling your brain with like, yeah, important things, but it's not valuable unless you're actually doing something with it. So I try really hard like 
Um, I mean, I talk about this in the book. I have this little thing, the air, A is for action, I is for investigate or idea, and R is for read or research. And, you know, even now during our talk, you know, you told me to listen to that book and I've got my R next to it because I need to read it. So it's like, that's me hearing content, but then taking the next step, which is the action. And as soon as I get off this call, the first thing I'm doing is actioning that. So it's like, you kind of got to, you've got to take true development is like the work really. Yeah. It's the work that you do. Yeah, no, very, very good point. You mentioned you've had mentors and coaches along the the way. So can you sort of, I guess, talk to the the value that they've provided? Yeah, I think, again, um, small business owners, it's the accountability piece that can be the most important. So just, you know, you don't have a boss. Um, if, you're, if you're the business owner, you no longer have someone else that you're accountable to. And being accountable to yourself would be one of the hardest things because, you know, you get to decide whether – you work 10% of your effort today or 100%. No one's pushing you and driving you, whereas a coach, whilst they won't drive you on the daily, they do a good coach anyway, will keep you accountable to yourself um, and to to what it is that you kind of want to achieve or they'll break down the barriers as to why you're not achieving those things, again, coming back to mindset and, and all the blocks. Um, it's really hard to do things alone. So I think, you know, even if you have a team, it's not not really your team's job to kind of mentor you, you, you're mentoring them. So having people around you, whether that's mentors, coaches, industry friends, it's really important that you're not going through it alone. Having that safe sounding board to kind of, you know, bounce ideas off. One of the challenges for me I found kind of midway through the the business journey was I just didn't have anyone at that strategic kind of management level that I could bounce ideas off. Um, and that was, again, coming back to that Jenny Stillwell's 7% Club, that's something that you need to identify what strategic advice you is available within your own team. And if it's not there, seek out a really good coach or mentor that can be that strategic partner, advisor, mentor, like whatever it is for you. Yeah, it's a good point. I think, uh, you know, having that team around you externally is so important. And, and like you shared, which was great before around, you know, this psychologist piece, yeah, you know, again, I think that's often something that maybe just that fear of what people think. So it's good you shared that because again, that is really so important as part of your team around you, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm a huge advocate for talking about mental health, mental well being, mm-hmm. all the things. I mean, we have access giving your team access to, you know, four sessions of therapy. Mm-hmm. Letting actually I put it in the back of the book. I think this is something that not a lot of small business owners know about. Um, but it's service Uh, through Beyond Blue called the Beyond Blue New Access for Small Business Owners. It's essentially um, a free guided self-help mental health and coaching program. And it's specifically for small business owners with less than 20 employees. And it's kind of a mix of business coaching, but also mental health, um, I guess, therapy. Not, Not many people know about that. So I would, I mean, I've referred it to so many people because sometimes it's just that one conversation where you've where you might share something that you're experiencing or feeling, you know, flat or down about, and somebody just gives you one different perspective, and it can honestly be game changing. Yeah, so I'm I'm a huge advocate for no matter who that person is. I mean, a coach is not there to to give you kind of you know medical advice, so to speak. They can give you more of the business advice, mm. but yeah, I think speaking out to someone is is really important. Yeah, that's great. So, Olivia, just our final five questions to wrap up this chat. So, what do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? Cash flow, definitely, and the management of cash flow. Yeah. yeah. But I think, you know what? It's almost about accepting that too. I think accepting that that's, I don't think it's ever meant to be easy. If, you know, I don't think it's, you don't start a business where cash flow is just a tap that's always on. You need to constantly work out why is it leaky? Why is it, why, like, why is, why is the drain blocked? Like, it's, I think you, kind of have to acknowledge that it's going to constantly be something that you need to work on. Yeah. What about your favourite business book, which has helped you the most? Four-hour work week's pretty cool. That was definitely a big one in the early days, like when you want to set up a business that's, it's, again, it comes down to focus and working on the right things. That That's, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. What about any great podcasts or online learning tools? Love the diary of a CEO. It's not necessarily specifically about business as such, um, but they have some incredible guests on there and often a lot of them will come back to the mindset piece. So I think that's a great one. Mm, uh, good one. And one tool you'd recommend to help 
grow a small business? Mm. If you've got enough people in your database, definitely looking into definitely looking into like SMS email marketing. I think just on that, um, it, it, which you touched on before, at least you could control that. Yeah. I think it's important that like even if you only have 15 customers, like I don't know if you're in a service-based business, it is important to have some sort of system in place to mm. constantly nurture and retain your current customers because ultimately it's a lot less expensive to acquire or to retain, sorry, a customer than it is to acquire new ones. Yeah. So not necessarily a tool, but what tools can you put in place to nurture the customers that you currently have and get them to kind of purchase more? Yeah, yep. that's a really good point. And finally, what would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? Oh, um, it's you're in it for the long haul. Like this is not overnight. Like you, if you if you're doing this, like strap yourself in. This is it's a marathon. It's not a yeah. sprint. Yep. Yep. And like you're doing, doing it for the right reasons, and and, yeah. and that, that's sort of aligned to your your purpose. So and make it's it fun, right? It's like a marriage. You're in it for the, you know, till death do us part. Like it's it's literally like a marriage. You have to put in the daily work. Yeah. 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 But like there's you the, said, there's the there. unmarried person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, don't forget the fun bit, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Look, thanks so much for uh, for the chat, Olivia. It's been uh, great. And again, uh, if you've got a small business, get out and uh, get Olivia's book, Self Made. Um, it's a great story, a lot of learnings uh, to share and a, a wonderful journey so far. So wish you all the best going forward and um, you know, look for an opportunity to catch up at some point. Amazing. Thank you so much. No worries. That's it. Thanks for listening. Please leave a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. It means more small business owners will find our cast and help people with their business growth journey.